So tēnā koutou katoa. Another week has flown by and there's only 30 weeks until Christmas. But for tonight, Christmas comes early with Emel. Emel is a wound care specialist at Dunedin Hospital. He has an extensive background in wound care, general and vascular surgery, along with intensive care. Currently in his role at Otago DHB, he is responsible for the selection and evaluation of wound care products and technology. He is also an executive member and the treasurer, so into the money, for the New Zealand Wound Care Society. Tonight's Emel's presentation is In Time Wounds Will Heal. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Catherine, for the lovely inter, um, introduction. So, yes, uh, my name is Emil and I'm the wound care specialist. Um, I, uh, I'm a practical person, so I work in clinics every day uh, on the ward in trust hospitals around Otago, which is the second largest uh, um, district by square kilometers, and I'm the only uh, specialist around. So I love it. I've done it for 15, 16 years now. So I hope that this presentation on time um, will be of use to you and uh, will be interesting. I leave about 10 minutes for question time at the end. Um, so um, that uh, hopefully will fill the time uh, nicely. So let's get started right away. So when we talk about T-I-M-E, and you might have heard that, first of all, I might go back 20 years ago. 20 years ago, the term wound bed preparation was um, first uh, uh, coined, really, and the European Wound Management Association a position document. And by the way, I will refer to the UMAR, the European Wound Management Association uh, website a lot, because the good thing is I have a lot of these documents freely available in many languages and they were really uh, put together by 40 different countries and they're really good um, documents. So this position document on wound preparation was done about 20 years ago. It really came out of the development of uh, wound dressings and modalities we use for wound care and it came by that basically we had so many uh, new dressings came into the market, and yet we often failed to heal, um, hard to heal wounds. So there was a theoretical concept about a wound bit preparation, um, but it, felt, it sort of didn't really have a clinical application. So out of this term, and the term wound bit preparation is still used today around the world and very topical. Out of this wound bed preparation concept, um, so basically how do we make uh, the dressings uh, more uh, workable? Out of this uh, came the term uh, time, T-I-M-E. And it describes me what are the barriers to healing and how can those observed, uh, be observed at the bedside? And how do they interrelate? And also then what is the appropriate clinical action or intervention? So time was a few years later. So it's been around for 15 years and really is the, 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 the test of time because it is used quite a lot around the world in wound care. And uh, some of you, or maybe quite a few of you have heard of this uh, term. So time is an acronym. It stands for T for tissue, I for infection or inflammation, M for moisture imbalance, and E for each. So when we talk about wound bit preparation and time, and we're looking at time, we really, I just want to throw this slide in because never forget that you need to, of course, look at the whole patient. So we don't just look at the wound, we look at the whole patient. And we will focus a lot of today on this time, obviously, because it's a topic, but we always need to do a holistic patient assessment. We need to make sure that we've got the accurate diagnosis and a timely uh, wound assessment, all right? So everything else, the patient factors, the wound factors, and the assessment needs to be done within context of time. You always have to treat the, under, treat of the underlying cause. And we talk a little bit more about that. So here we are, this is just a wound, uh, our wound care chart we use in the Southern DHB, uh, which is uh, page one. It basically just shows you that that it's important that you treat the underlying factor 
for example, diabetes. So if you don't get the diabetes, the HbI1 right, uh, you will struggle to heal wounds because simply they don't. Um, so we, for example, work with a multidisciplinary team with a nurse practitioner, myself, and orthopedics and, and, and vascular and uh, clinical nurse specialist for diabetes together in one clinic uh, on a Friday where we see patients with diabetic fibrosis. And then we need to talk a lot about, you know, getting the diabetes control right. Now, these are the common sort of um, um, causes uh, or, or impediments of, of, of wound healings and others, you know, uh, we don't have to go through this in the interest of time. So here we are, this treat the whole patient and not the hole in the patient. It's not the wound that is complex, it is the patient. Again, just TIME, what it stands for. So let's look at those barriers to wound healing. So what are they? So basically, it's whatever sits on the top of the wound bead. By the way, we're looking at hard to heal wounds today. So hard to heal wounds is really a wound which is in my core, you know, that's what I see all the time. Okay, it's not acute wounds, acute wounds heal without any problems. Okay, you can do uh, dressings, you can clean it and leave the dressing on for a week and within a fortnight, you know, you know exactly how they heal and what they look like. And then you've got the hard to heal wounds. That's our topic in our assessment for today. Hard to heal wounds are wounds which will heal, hopefully, okay, but there's a lot of barriers towards it. And a lot of that is, for example, the prolongedness of the infl inflammatory stage of healing. So those wounds often are in the inflammatory phase of the wound healing. This causes a focus of for infection. So these slough necrosis and biofilm sitting on those uh, wound beads, uh, that's what, they, what, the, what, what the problem is. They really hinders the re of the wound in itself, that just means that the skin will not move from the side and it's painful for the patient. And it's, as we all know, uh, leads to reduced quality of life. And you can see that from the photo here of a chronic leg also and how the uh, slough, the greenish tingy slough uh, looks quite painful. And you look at the wound in itself, it's highly inflamed. And you can see or hear probably, if you listen very hard, you can hear the patient, you know, crying out for help. So let's look at the wound bead and how can we assess it? Again, we use our, I use my, our wound uh, assessment ch chart. Okay, so we look at the wound bead. What sort of, what can you see in the wound bead? Basically there are four colors. Okay, the two colors we want in the wound and two colors we don't want. All right, so dry eschar or black necrosis, we don't want in the wound and we don't want slough in the wound. Okay, eschar is deep tissue. It's a, a you know, dense, uh, deep black tissue. Um, you know, today I debrided a wound, a pressure injury, uh, which is a leathery type sort of tissue. All right, it's deep. It won't come back to alive. Whatever you do, uh, that's what it is. Yellow slough. Slough on top of the wound is also deep tissue. It's deep debris on the wound bead, depending on the water contents of the slough, can be quite soft, quite runny, and can be quite hard and tenacious. So these are the two colors we do not want in the wound bead. Then we got two colors we do want, which is the red tissue and the pink tissue. So by the way, this is quite a simple way of doing it, but that is used around the world. Four colors, we want pink and red. Red is granulation tissue, pink is epithelialization tissue. It's a bit of tongue twister, but this is basically the skin which got grows in from the side. And you can see from the wound chart, what you then do is just put a percentage around uh, what you see in the wound bead. Let's practice it for a couple of slides. So here we are, what you see is a lower leg also. Okay, it's covered with yellow. All right, so yellow is the color we don't want. Then you put a percentage around it. And you could say triple glances would be 90, 95% of slough. And then you have 5% of granulation tissue at the edge. 
okay? The edge itself is rounded, it's not advancing, all right? We haven't got any ESCA there. So here's another a pressure injury, a non stagional pressure injury. All right, again, you just look at the wound bead at the moment, the stuff you can see, all right, which is the slough, yellow, it's a bit greenish, and it sort of um, dries up a little bit, that's why it gets black, all right. Again, you could say, you know, maybe it's 80%, all right, uh, and 20% granulation tissue, all right. And by the way, you uh, well, don't fret over it, and don't have a meeting with 10 people about if it's 80% or 75%, all right? I usually say, don't have a hooey about it, all right? But um, you know what I mean? It's not that important at the moment. You just need to put your foot in the sand and say, this is where we are, all right? Here we see a perianal abscess. So this just looks quite healthy. You can see the granulation tissue in the middle, and you can see here the edge advancing. So the edge, the pink, area advancing, the wound will heal through contraction and through epithelialization or the skin tissue moving in. Because it's a healthy wound, it will move in. And I think that's the last one here, another pressure injury uh, <clears throat> on a heel. Okay, again, it's a non stageable one. You can see dry, black eschar, about 80%, and then 20% uh, granulation tissue. So, Okay, so, so when you look at the wound bead in itself, that can be a is a really important part of your assessment, all right? Because what you can see here on this wound is here, that on the left side, that photo was taken in the middle of September last year. And, and then later, of, actually that's wrong, and then uh, later on, a few weeks later, after debridement, that photo was taken again. Now the wound bead, as you can see on the left, um, is, is a lot of slough, it's about 95% slough. On the right, you get a lot of uh, he, um, bloody sort of tissue there, reed tissue, which is much healthier tissue. So you have improved the wound bead in the period of time uh, it took. And if, but the wound itself in size has not changed because that will take time. I will show you some, some other photos, like this one here um, on the left side. Again, it's tenacious, sick, slough, okay, on the right side after debridement, after wound, um, uh, wound um, uh, debridement options, uh, the wound bead looks much better. All right, so we moved from, from let's say, 90% down to 60% in terms of slough, and the rest is granulation tissue. This is important, the size has not changed but you can talk to the patient and to your client, whatever you call them, uh, you know, that is a big improvement. That is a big improvement, which should be celebrated. All right, so often the wound doesn't change in, in size, because that will take time. You need to get the wound bit right first before the wound will get smaller. All right, very important. So that's when we talk about wound bit preparation. So how are we gonna do that? So we have wound cleansing. Wound cleansing is a removal of dirt or foreign material. So you cleanse the wound at every dressing change, obviously. You can use uh, water, which is suitable for drinking. It doesn't have to be sterile, or it could be normal saline. Cleansing is not debridement. Often what we do in our clinic um, is, um, you know, we use a bucket and we use a, you know, a water and we use soapy water and we really scrub the leak. Also, for example, we really clean it, all right? Often that is not just, um, you know, let's say five mils of saline, all right, and then play around for a half an hour. No, no, that's what I say, look, this is not a cleaning, cleansing. You really need to get into it and, and, and have a good, have a good wash and a good cleansing of the wound with, um, with cloth or with, with other mechanical devices, which we we'll talk later on. But what we need to do often is what I do in my clinic and what you can do in, in your, where you work, is deprive the wound. And what is debridement? Debridement differs from cleansing because it removes thick, adherent, deep and contaminated tissue. So this 
um, black tissue and the slough, the yellow tissue, that's what it uh, will clean from a wound in the peri wound skin. The peri wound skin is really important. In fact, a lot of um, uh, scholars say the whole World Union meeting in September a year and a half ago uh, was about the, the elephant in the room, which was the peri wound skin, the surrounding skin of the wound. Getting that to a really healthy state will uh, go towards a good uh, way of healing the wound. So why is deprivement important? I don't want to go through this here really. You're going to have the handouts or you're going to have access to this presentation later on. But it has shown in multiple trials and uh, you know there's one, the second one here just shows in a retrospective cohort study of 312,744 wounds. Now that's amazing, all right? It has shown that the more frequent the deprivement of the wound is, the better is the healing outcome. And the same thing is with for diabetic photosis. You know, Armstrong, which is a real high scholar for diabetic photosis in the States, who has done many research studies, he again and again showed that the more you deprive the wound, the better uh, the wound healing is. Why? Because deprivement removes the sources of inflammation and infection. We talked about the slough and it's not healthy. We really need to get rid of this. How do you get rid of this? Okay, so again, I don't want to go through these in details. We haven't got the time. Uh, basically, the take home message from that slide is you've got the necrosis, you all know that. It's the dead, dead stuff, okay, in black. And then you've got the slough. And, and the slough is you, the fancy words for this, but um, it depends really how how much water content it is, the so hyperkeratosis, you've got uh, zero crusts. Often it's just really dried up slough. And that's also when you really have a bucket of water and you clean it, um, really you can see how the wound in itself looks so much better afterwards. Just as a hint, uh, for burns, for example, nine out of 10 patients I see from the community have their wounds not properly cleaned, cleansed and cleaned um, for various reasons. So deprivement reduces all this uh, hematomas, foreign bodies, and uh, bone fragments. It's good for the tissue because it decreases the odor and the risk of infection. It has and restores the bacterial burden. It stimulates the wound age and the skin, skin uh, moving in, and certainly improves the quality of life because the pain is quite, quite, greatly reduced when we reduce, when we in, improve the wound bead. All right, and it improves the normal biochemistry in the wound bead. So we talked earlier on that the wound is stuck in inflammatory phase. The next phase after inflammation is proliferation. Okay, basically it just means that the extracellular matrix, so the wound starts healing, that can go into this next phase. We have hard to heal wounds, often they're stuck in this inflammatory phase. So quality of life is improved all over. So when you do debridement, uh, must be a process. Like everything else, we, you, I, we don't live in isolation, even not under COVID. Uh, we don't live in isolation. We had our networks and we depend on it because we are social beasts, so to speak. So same thing with debridement. Debridement must be part of a process. So for example, if I debride a wound, like a diabetic foot ulcer, but don't put it into a whole context, then it um, might as well not be done because the callus will be uh, back the next week uh, just uh, like before. So it must be done in conjunction with other treatment approaches to have a beneficial clinical goal. And here you can see a typical uh, patient with a diabetic for also two ulcers, one on the, on the, under the heel, one under the first metatarsal, and I'll talk about that a bit more later in the presentation. Um, so again, here we are. This is from the Yuma website. It's from the Journal of Wound Care. This is a, a document on debridement. And also it talks a lot about this debridement cycle. All right, so you can access it freely. A very versatile document to, to look at if you have interest in it. So that's the debridement cycle, which is uh, described there. So based, uh, basically what we need to do, we have a diagnosis, 
We then have a diagnosis for diabetic foot ulcer, for example. We then need to think about um, what we want to achieve, what, uh, what treatment options we want to do. So we decide on this, okay, and then decide, for example, let's do autolytic debridement, okay, then what else can we do? That is a really most important question. Not just the dressing we put on, all right, but then what else can we do? And then the add-ons, and then we review it, then we have the goal achieved, yes, that's fine, continue with the treatment. If you're not a goal achieved, then you go the cycle again, see? So it's a quality cycle we all learn all the time, do we? So have a look at this. Now I think this is a patient who had a cardiac surgery and he had his um, uh, leg wounds where they did the vein grafting, it uh, broke uh, the hist basically. So it was an open wound. Uh, this is in stages of healing already, but you can see here the wound has a tenacious slough sitting on the wound bead. Uh, there's some granulation tissue, all right, but we wanted to improve that and wanted to move, sure, like we just talked about it, improve the wound bead. So ideally, we want 100% granulation tissue, read tissue. So the diagnosis is the hist uh, lower leg ulcer wound um, or surgical hist wound, all right. What we want to do is for this uh, autolytic debridement, so autolytic debridement is like a solicide or solo gel. Okay, so we did that, but what else can we do? Okay, so you put the solicide on, put the dressing on, what else can you do? Okay, so we added on compression bandaging because we know that if we reduce the edema in the lower leg, in the lower limb, we get improved wound healing. So improved wound healing with, with reducing the edema, we use compression bandaging. And the review after, uh, after a certain time looks at this, that we had achieved 100% 100 uh, granulation tissue formation with the intervention we did. So we achieved that goal, and then we continue that cycle until we completed wound healing. So what are the options of debridement? Okay, so select the debridement methods most appropriate to the patient, to the wound bit clinical setting and overall goal. goal. And also obviously uh, uh, of your technical ability, of your environment and, and so forth. All right, so there are six or seven different uh, debridement options I wanted to go through um, in my presentation. And the first one is autolytic debridement. So autolytic debridement is indicated for many wounds of acute and chronic nature. Okay, and this is one uh, debridement option which you can do in your practice um, uh, with the GP and your, in wherever you work. Um, and the district nurses do it a lot. Okay, where you basically um, apply a hydrogel to the wound bead to rehydrate, to soften or to liquefy hard esca or slough. All right, so that's a really good uh, gentle debridement option. Uh, think about the surrounding skin, because what you do is basically apply, uh, apply, uh, apply 95% uh, water. Okay, so 95% water, it's like chilled water, just protect the surrounding skin uh, with some barrier creams, um, sink paste, for example, or commercially available wipes. All right. Uh, there are some other uh, debridement options which also uses hydrogel and have added antimicrobial um, contents in it, like catexima iodine. Okay. Um, all right. And um, so these are some of the options we have. There are, you know, there, there are many, many different options um, on the market. I do not want to go into one particular product. All right, just remember generic terms. Remember that you should have a hydrogel within your, uh, in your dressing cupboard. Um, and that is appropriate for this type of wounds to de slough and to soften up the, uh, uh, the, uh, the necrotic area or the slough in itself. Okay, as I see, some of them have uh, antimicrobials in it, like uh, the Cadexman, like the iota soap or the Prontosan or the silver uh, 
a gel can be quite useful if you have a local infection. There's one uh, caveat I have to put in here now, and that is really important. Okay, if there's poor blood supply, keep it dry. Uh, so we talk about moist wound healing and we talk about uh, hydrogel, but if there's poor blood supply, keep it dry. Do not debride stable, hard, dry esca in ischemic limbs. That's also really important for pressure injuries. And I see so many of them, far too many. Um, you know, keep it intact as long as you can um, and follow the guidance from the wound specialists or the clinics. Uh, there's a good reason for this because you don't want to create a moist gangrene when you put um, hydrogels, for example, on. Allow for the tissue to separate itself over time. So we call that demarcation. You know, that black toe, for example, that will lift off. Okay, they will demarcate between the living area and the dead area, and that will heal nicely. It will be a much smaller wound than we had, uh, would have had if we debrided and, um, uh, and put uh, hydrogel on. And get advice. Enzymatic um, dressings, which break down also the uh, slough um, and uh, ESCA, can be very useful. Problem is they're not registered in New Zealand, so it's hard to come by. Maggots, you might have used uh, maggots uh, and we, we do that in our clinics. They're really microsurgeons. Um, they're, uh, they're sharp debridements, uh, may, uh, will be hard to achieve. Uh, it is not painful, so you can, uh, you can do it in clinics. And patients, when they uh, educated on it, uh, they follow the protocol as to the nurses. So it can be very useful. And then again, uh, mechanical debridement, uh, debris soft, for example, um, the different microfiber pads on the market, that can be very useful for debridement of the wounds. As you can see on the left, uh, uh, on the photos on uh, photo A, where you have, um, you know, 95% slough, the same wound debrided or cleansed with a microfiber pad uh, in the same setting. So they can be very useful. It is no point to put a silver dressing on the left wound, for example, uh, which costs you a lot of money and doesn't make any difference. We need to get on top of the wound bead first. We need to cleanse it, we need to debride it, we need to clean it up. Don't uh, throw around expensive dressings. We can do mechanical debridement, uh, where we use uh, a sharp curette, for example, to lift up fluff. That can be very useful. I've done it today on a patient's very deep pressure injury, all right, where you can, uh, it was hard to access. So you just use a sharp curette and you can peel that off uh, nicely. Um, often we use a topical um, Emla cream or a silicone. Uh, topical for half an hour beforehand to numb the area because obviously it looks painful and can be very painful. Some patients have neuropathy, so it can work very well for that uh, for those clients. Uh, you know, so this is the biofilm. We need to get rid of that stuff. All right, it is not good to leave it on. Nowadays we have uh, also a new negative pressure system, uh, which uh, instills uh, cleansing products and also sucks uh, the fluid away. You, you might have seen negative pressure, heard of them. Uh, it's used um, a lot in uh, wound care circles for district nurses um, and so forth. So, but another development is this therapy here where you can instill disinfection solutions, let them sit into the wound and then suck them away again on the circle. That will be done in the hospital. And this patient here is a groin dissection um, which was uh, getting inf was infected, and that was after three days with treatment of the Vera Flower, the Calcleans Choice, with very good effect. So we're trying that at the moment and see what uh, success we have. Another one for deprivement options, which you don't have, uh, obviously, is but we do in the clinic is the ultrasound deprivement uh, system, where we use um, where we use. Uh, charged uh, particles of saline on the wound in itself. You can see the leg also here protected by a sink cream surrounding skin. Then you hover above the wound 
the steam basically. It's a bit like going to the dental hygienist and the steam or the, 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 the thousands of bubbles are charged with energy and they're clean the wound bed and, uh, and to kill bacteria, but also get rid of the slough and um, on the wound bed in itself. So these treatments can be very useful. We're doing a randomized controlled trial since two and a half years, and uh, we hope to have a intermittent uh, ride up uh, pretty soon. Um, and um, that is very good to be done in an outpatient setting, again, under local anesthetic topical, and it uh, only takes about 10 minutes to do. All right. And then, of course, you got the sharp and surgical deprivement. Um, should be done by trained uh, practitioners, obviously, uh, often done in um, clinics, but you have to be aware of your environment and you follow local guidelines. The difference between sharp and surgical is really that with a sharp, you leave a thin margin of necrotic or dead tissue behind because you don't want to cut into the living tissue because you can be uh, troubled with uh, lots of bleeding and also can be quite painful. So surgical deprivement is doing that, which has been done under an aesthetic in theatre often. All right, so today I've done a stage uh, three pressure injury and deprived it and the sharp deprivement. It was bleeding a little bit, but I couldn't go deeper because the environment where I was working in a rest home just wasn't suitable to take a greater risk. So, you know, then you work with your plastic surgeons and so forth and uh, discuss uh, the case and then uh, hey, make a plan in place. Think about the private circle. Okay, just um, uh, in the interest of time, I won't go into that, which makes a lot of sense. Just make sure you understand your anatomy. Don't um, fall for it, you know, when people ask you to deprive the Achilles tendon, uh, they can be uh, troublesome because uh, you can cut that through very quickly. And then you have to explain that to your patient and to your surgeon. So be careful, know your anatomy and be really careful, careful, careful. So the next thing is eye inflammation and infection. Just a quick word on biofilm. Biofilm is in all, you know, everybody talks about it. It's a biofilm is a thick sort of layer on top of the wound, which is basically that slough um, in a thick bacterial layer. Um, it can be invisible. It doesn't have to be slough. It can be like a, a slimy sort of film. Um, what it is, it's bacteria. So they cling together with like super glue. They secrete glyco calyx, okay, and they stick together like super glue. They sit on top of the wound, all right, and now you think about it, okay, when you put a dressing on here, okay, the biofilm is just having fun. You're not even getting through it, all right? So that's why we have to do the debridement, all right, and we talked about it already, you know, sharp debridement, mechanical debridement, all this. You need to get through that biofilm. Antibiotics don't work either often because they can, can't go penetrate the wound bead in itself. They can't go through this. That's why you have, for example, when you have uh, um, uh, antibiotics for leg ulcers, uh, often, yeah, they look really good after a few days, okay, and uh, they stop after a week, and what happens? All right, they don't heal leg ulcers, okay? They don't heal chronic wounds, all right? so. That is the reason, all right? Um, so biofilms are bad news, all right? Sticky stuff, and you really have to get really hard onto the biofilm. They now have studies that say 100% of hard to heal wounds. So wounds which are older than three, four weeks and have failed to heal have biofilms. The vast majority, 90 plus percent, crazy, okay? It's not the clear diagnostic tests to confirm the presence it just basically gets a clinical decision. But you can assume if you have that wound, uh, a hard to heal wound, that you get biofilm there. That's the important, uh, just shows how important the debridement is for a wound, okay? So when we debride it, that's what our technique is. We do all this, you do your solar gel, your hydrogel, we do other stuff, you might do other stuff, okay? When you've done it, you need to make sure you prevent the biofilm from happening again, because the done tests 
all right, where the A base, where we, where we, you know, cut this all away and we did the ultrasound, blah, blah, blah. And then after a week, the biofilm is back. All right. Okay. So it's now considered a good um, practice to use cleansing solutions with surfactants or antimicrobials and um, with um, uh, confirmed, in you know, with, uh, uh, with uh, hard to heal wounds. So we use, for example, the ultrasound department, uh, the wand, you know, with the saline, all right, we clean it, and everything is hunky dory, looks fantastic. Then we use an active coat silver dressing, or it could be an iota soap, okay, which is a, an iodine dressing, to have an antiseptic on it on top of the wound to prevent the biofilm from happening again. Okay, so here we are, integrated department, best method for biofilm removals, I told you all this. All right, again, a good document here from Yuma. I mean, I'm from Germany, so no wonder I use Yuma, all right. There is Wounds Australia, I'm involved with the Wound Care Society since 20 years. So, you know, but the Yuma document, it's 300 million people, they've got money to burn, you know. So they're really good documents and they're freely available, often in 10, 15 different languages. Okay, so uh, let's talk a bit about antimicrobials. So control the bacteria burden. We talked about the deprivement, so we stop here. Um, and the antiseptics, what type of antiseptics, okay? So we use iodine. So we use Cardexima, I told you that, the um, iota soap. Look, there are many others on the market. Silver compounds, the PHMB uh, is an antiseptic, um, which is in certain dressings. And then chlorhexidine, acetic acid, which is, a uh, which is vinegar, and then honey. This is the main ones we use. And I, there's a completely different talk, and I can talk about this for another hour, but I won't, because my daughter tells me I'm talking far too much. All right, so uh, vinegar. Everybody, so we're using it down a bit, be aware that can be painful. Uh, so you need to dilute it, it's a household vinegar. So I'm using that for, for example, for that wound you saw early on with the green pseudomonas infection leg ulcer. So very effective against uh, pseudomonas. I use one part of 5% vinegar, nine parts of water, mix it all together, soak the gauze, leave it on top of the wound for five to 10 minutes, do that for five to seven days daily, and then it will take care of the pseudomonas. You don't need antibiotics for this. Just uh, make sure that you dilute it. The solution to any pollution is in the dilution, all right? And then you wash it off, and then you put your dressing on. So now we're on to M for moisture balance. You know, we talked about moist wound healing environment and we really know that since about 30, 40 years now, um, that um, <clears throat> that is um, important, but you know, also it is not good if we have two uh, wet wounds, okay? We want moist, we don't want it to dry, we don't want it to wet. Now we want dry wounds sometimes, and I told you when, and that is really important. This is a lower limb, poor blood flow scenario, or it is a heel pressure injury scenario, which is a black heel or black hip with a pressure injury. Leave it dry until you get the proper uh, advice. But usually moist, okay, not too wet. So here we are in maceration. Maceration is a largely under-recognized problem. Okay, often we get the wounds too wet, and you can see here um, a pressure injury on the heel, Okay, and there it's very macerated. All right, the dressing was on and it, the blister popped, all right, got very macerated. Okay, you can see the dark area in the middle and then the maceration. If you look closer, um, you know, I, I do ask people, you know, what do they think it is? It's quite hard to see, but it's actually the dressing still in place, some, some bits. There's some of the old skin still in place from the blister. All right, so what would you do? I can't ask you directly, so I'll tell you. Don't use five mils of saline, okay? So you know the answer now. Just ring back 20 minutes ago. Can you get a bucket of water, all right? Get a bucket of water, use a bit of chlorhexidine, soap or whatever, 
and then you really clean the whole area up, okay? And then you can see what you're dealing with. Okay, you might be surprised, it might not be just as bad as you think it looks at the moment. Yeah, and the moisture balance needs to be right. So this is a lower leg uh, wound, uh, sorry, a lower leg of a patient of mine who came into the clinic desperate for help. And this is a uh, neck is around a lower, uh, uh, lower leg. Okay, and you can see the soft band, you can see the great bandage on the knees. Okay, so this uncontrolled exudate leads to a lot of um, lot of drama and lots of uh, problems for the patients, from pain to embarrassment to smell to leave carpets which are wet to husbands. We you can't stand the smell to grandkids who are not coming anymore for visits. Social isolation is awful. Okay, we are really need to get top of of the exudate. Okay, how can we do it? Well, we can do it directly, and I showed you one photo with compression bandaging which was really important. Another one we can do is the negative pressure dressing. Okay, so we, we talked about that briefly, but you know, deprivement. Deprivement to improve the wound bead will reduce the exudation, all right? And then obviously absorb, absorbent dressing. And indirectly we can uh, treat the cause of infection and inflammation, be it through antibiotics. Antibiotics do have that uh, place. If, for example, you got a leg ulcer uh, wound and the patient has systemic changes, temperature up, systemic sepsis and stuff, there's no doubt you need antibiotics. If you've got cellulitis raging in the foot, you need antibiotics. Okay, sometimes IV antibiotics, sometimes they need to be admitted. Okay, but often we don't need this. We just need topical antiseptics or antimicrobials. I show you here our wound product guidelines uh, from DHP, from our DHP. Uh, the reason I show you that is really not to show off, but to just show you uh, that it will be really useful wherever you work to have one of those product guidelines in place. So if you look at this one here, it's actually quite, I say, succinct. I don't want to use simple, it's succinct. So we don't have many different products. We have about 15 different products in the whole DHP. That includes Southland and Otago. All right. But we have very good products and we people know what they need to use it for. All right. So, for example, the primary product is Solocyte, Intracyte, which is a hydrogel. It's a function is the slough and rehydrate. Secondary dressing in Opside or Comfuel or Mipilex border, which is the foam we use. And the indications for dry necrosis, dry slough. Here, practice tips. Not for wet wounds, apply at five millimeter thickness, lift up to three days, recommend intracyte conformal dressing over exposed tendon and bone to keep moisture and viable. This is basically all our knowledge from the wound care specialists, okay? We give you practice tips. So have a wound product guideline available in your area wherever you work, write one up. I always say when I go to GPs or, you know, or go around, really doesn't matter where it is, rest homes or whatever, there's no point having a cabinet like this, you know, and up and down having hundreds of products in there if you don't know how to use them. Make sure that you know what to use them for. Have less is much better. All right? So we have one product for each category. Finally now, the next couple of minutes and then we're finished, uh, is E. So you're doing very well. All right, because usually I, I uh, you know, uh, people ask questions and, uh, uh, you know, stuff like this. So hopefully you're still with me and I haven't lost you along the track. So time, we on time, T-I-M-E, the E stands for each or epithelialization. So that's a skin movement. Okay, so the each needs to advance. Oh, well, funny that, because if the each doesn't advance, if the skin doesn't move in, the wound will not heal. But the wound, the itch will only move in if you get the wound bit right in the surrounding skin. You'll be dreaming if you think you can wound, heal the wound without it. If you get an unhealthy wound bead, it just won't happen. Okay? So this wound, for example, here, the itch is not advancing. You can see a lot of um, zero crusts, dried up slough sitting on top of the edge, on top of the surrounding skin, all right? The wound bead, yeah, it looks a bit, 
pinkish and it looks a bit healthy-ish, but if you look closer, um, then in, uh, obviously I know the patient, but this is actually hypergranulation tissue. That's unhealthy tissue, which needs to be debrided. It's very friable, it's very fragile tissue. All right, so again, this should be cleaned with a bucket of water and get rid of this the zero crusts, this dried up slough at the edge. Again, here, this is a diabetic foot also. So here, the wound is not advancing. Why? Because the wound needs to be debrided. The wound edge, you can see that the white, yellowish callus formation. And I promise you, I'll come back to the, one of the first photos where you could see those ring donuts. Okay? So I debride this all the time in the clinics where you debride that callus formation. And the callus builds up very quickly because a lot, a lot of pressure in that area. All right, so that's where the um, circle of assessment comes in and the circle of debridement. Debride it, then you put the dressings on, then you offload it. And then you have an offloading shoe on, all right? So you prevent this callus from happening again. Again, here, the edge is not advancing, so that's a cavity wound, which is a perianal abscess. The edge is not advancing. There's tunneling, all right. This tunneling needs to come up and heal up first. And this indicates a non-healing wound because it's highly inflamed. Okay, it's unhealthy slough sitting on top. Okay, it could be an inflammatory <coughs> uh, problem here, but it could also be an infection. Okay, so this odor could be uh, involved in here. Um, you could, uh, you know, we, we just need to get that right, either through antimicrobials or maybe antibiotics. What's happening here? Well, you've seen that white, um, sort of soggy surrounding skin, all right? That's maceration. The wood is far too wet, all right? The edges will break down. It will be very soft, friable, and brittle. Okay, so we need to really make sure we get this wound back in the surrounding skin. Protect the surrounding skin. Use some stink paste, use some secure creams, have really good ointments and creams available, or use a um, skin prep, for example. Here, there is an advancing uh, a wound, uh, a skin healing. Okay, they indicates a healing wound, all right, that the uh, wound will heal through contraction, all right, and uh, that uh, that will be fine. So here we are in the summary. The principles of wound bed preparation. Healthy wound bed means a healing wound. You need to think about the T for the tissue. We talked about the different tissue types, the four different tissue types, yellow, black, we don't want, red and pink, we do want. Quite simple, put your foot in the sand. If you've got 90% um, slough to begin with, if you're in two weeks time, through your autolytic debridement, hydrogel, have achieved 60% slough, big achievement, okay? Huge achievement, keep going. Prevent biofilm from happening, use an antiseptic, uh, use an, uh, a cleanser, which uh, got an um, antiseptic um, uh, in it. Okay, um, use, avoid maceration. Keep the wound in a balanced state. Avoid maceration, that's not too wet, all right? And again, be aware of the poor blood flow. If you, got poor, poor, poor blood, if you have got poor blood flow, then keep it dry. And protect, protect the surrounding skin. You need the surrounding skin healthy in order to uh, uh, move the wound forward into the next stage. So here's time for you. Some references for the eager ones to look at it tonight. Any questions? <laughs> oh, I've got lots of questions for Have you. Have you? Good. <laughs> no, not too many. Thank you. No? That was amazing. You were on fire this evening. You don't need <laughs> anyone in the room with you. You were doing very well. I agree with your children. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. the first question up for you this evening is where can we get maggots from? Yeah, it depends. Well, I can tell you where we get them from. Um, we get them from Wellington. So there's a lady there who breeds them. Um, 
I'm uh, my my email address is on the presentation. So email me, and I don't know uh, north the northern part of the North Island. You know the rest of the North Island. We used to get them from Christchurch, but that lady has retired. So it's some somebody keen to breed those things. The good thing is they actually come down in price over the years. I remember when we had one shot come in, pot, in a bottle, um, and uh, they were two hundred dollars per bottle. So now they're thirty dollars. Uh, uh, they're thirty dollars per 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 bottle, you know. And um, right, so, uh, they um, they they're much cheaper, so much easier. They come uh, nicely packed with instructions. Just if you use maggots, <coughs> I'm also happy to share everything if you want. Um, the maggots. Um, Make sure you got a local policy, all right. Um, they, they, they can be a bit tricky to apply and stuff like this. So yeah. Very good. Now, is there recommended amount of EMLA, etc., gel and protocol for debridement? Uh, that's a very good question and uh, a tricky one. Um, we have a local guideline. I work with the paint team quite a lot. Um, the, um, uh, David Jones, who has been there for a long time, we use Emla, we use uh, um, lignocaine, and we have uh, we have morphine tinctures with hydrogel for chronic pain and wounds. And we get that prescribed by by the doctors uh, to uh, to use it on topical wounds. Um, it's used around the world. Uh, the Wound Care Society and Australian Wounds Association or Wounds Australia uh, uh, since many years try to write deprivement guidelines, including topical, uh, topical anesthetics. If you're in Europe, for example, you can get uh, dressings which have a pain relief embedded into it, like proofen, all right? So it is not controversial, it's just not very common. Okay, thank you. How long to use protozan on wounds? Um, usually what we do, we have uh, some protozan gel. You can leave, up. so what we do is for, for these things is we do a, a two weekly challenge. So we do two weeks. So think always about the goal setting. So it's very hard to say how long, okay, you know, five minutes and 30 seconds. Uh, but you know, you leave them on, Set yourself a goal, and then reassess it. Have you achieved the goal? So, why do you use protozen gel, for example? The hydrogel is an antiseptic in it, which is a great product, and you can use it. You know, you want to do slough, which you can use. Have you achieved it? Then do it for a fortnight, because it takes two weeks to see a difference. The worst thing out there in the, in the world of New Zealand and the wider world and everywhere the same is, the worst thing you can do is one nurse starts this, another nurse starts something else, you know, and they hear that all the time. Now, look, be, you know, uh, follow the wound care plan and don't change them within two weeks. Okay, follow it. You cannot see the difference earlier. So I'm sorry, the answer is, depending on the goal, I would say at least two weeks. Thank you. Um, do you find compression better over soft band crepe method? Do I find compression better over? Soft crepe band, you know the crepe band bandaging, the sort of soft fluffy stuff? Oh yeah, okay. So crepe bandage is not compression. Okay, forget about that, it's not compression. That is a way of anchoring or fixing a uh, dressing. Soft band is a way of uh, forgetting about your wound, so you don't, and, you know, keeping it nice and soft, um, but it's not compression. So um, compression bandaging is the gold standard. We do that whenever we can. Uh, we usually do an ABI, so an ankle uh, brachial pressure index. We do that first to make sure we got good blood flow, and then it needs to be done by a trained a uh, person on compression bandaging, which we do all the time training for. I have to say though, there's one way when we use soft band, crepe bandage, and double tubic wrap. It's something you can do wherever you work uh, without doing damage. 
it has to be really, really bad to cause, like in terms of a terrible blood flow, but you'd be really safe because uh, tubic rep in itself, it's such a light compression, which is about eight to 10 millimeters of mercury, you can do that. Great bandage in itself has no compression. So what we do, if we don't, can't do AVIs for various reasons, we do soft band, crate bandage, and advise the nurses in a restroom, for example, over the phone, just put a couple of tubic grips on until we can get a better assessment. Any compression is better than no compression on the lower leg wounds. Crape is not compression, all right? Thank you. Um, what is the latest evidence on the use of an interface product between the wound and the back foam? Well, the latest evidence is, hasn't changed. I mean, just think about it. When you put an interface between the foam and the wound bead, you reduce the effectiveness of the foam. There's no doubt about it because you've got another layer in between. All right, so I hardly ever use an interface, all right, because the reason you use an interface often is because you've got a local infection there which is often evident with odor. So the wound smells. So if the wound smells, we stop the negative pressure, all right? We don't put an interface in like a silver dressing, which is about $30, $40 a dressing, all right? Plus the negative pressure, which is about another 100 to 150 per dressing, all right? So I, we have three guidelines say stop the negative pressure, get on top of the local odor, which does need antibiotics, nine out of 10, uh, you use an antimicrobial, you know what I just said now, use an antimicrobial, antiseptic, use a prontosin uh, solution, okay, for often just for a few days. And then you get the equilibrium between the bacteria and, and the wound healing uh, right. It doesn't mean there's no bacteria in there. There always will be bacteria, okay, but it's, uh, it's, it's in the right sort of uh, state again. So the, but basically is, I don't use it, it creates a less uh, functional negative pressure system, uh, but I know that other people will use it, but it's not our, our technique. Thank you. If doing a sinus, do you find me salt a good product if bleeding has stopped? Yeah, yeah, we use me salt uh, for pyloneal sinuses peri abscesses. Mesolt has been around for a long time. It's 20% salt, so it's a hyperosmotic dressing. It sucks up the fluid. So it's very can be very useful for hypergranulation and for sinuses. I just wanted to say for sinuses or for those wounds, cavity wounds, um, the principle. What goes in must come out. So you put one piece in, you put one piece out. All right, so because a mesolt is a sheet, depending what you, what you have, but we have sheets, okay? If you put two sheets in, you take two sheets out. Okay, same thing with negative pressure, all right? So really, really important, nothing more embarrassing, awful, and, uh, and really devastating for everybody, let alone the patient, if you have a retained dressing for three months, and we discovered in theater, because of abscess. Yep. And along that same line, we've got as a si oh, uh, in a sinus cavity, would you recommend a saline wick inserted? Saline wick. That's a really interesting question because I don't I don't think so. So I'm not sure why you would uh, water the saline wick. Um, there's sometimes questions coming up. For example, you might know the equisol rope, or let's say a uh, hydrofiber rope or an alginate rope. So that's the alginate rope. Uh, sometimes, for some reason, uh, once or twice a year, somebody comes up with the idea to moisten the rope, the equisol, the hydrofiber, before they put them into the wound. Now just think about it. The reason you put something in is to suck up the exudate. So if you moisten the gauze, with saline, or you moisten the aquacell with saline, water, whatever, well, you actually ruin the dressing because it can't suck up any fluid anymore. So I don't know about that question. There is uh, intracyte conformable, 
So maybe that's what's meant. Uh, intracite conformable is a gauze with a hydrogel. They can be useful if you got slough in the sinus, you want to deslough the area. So that's a, that's a different kettle of fish because you've got hydrogel in with gauze impregnated. Oh, I love those questions. <laughs> and so here we go, this one. Um, I am interested in the role of honey. Is it only as antimicrobial? And I have many reports of patients saying that the application products, um, uh, the application produces significant stinging pain. Is that an indication to stop? Yeah, well, good question. The honey has been around since a long time. And I knew Professor Maulan who done the original studies on honey uh, since about 10 years ago. Honey for certain, certainly in the wound care specialist, we don't use them a lot. There was a big trial, the Holt trial from Professor Andrew Zhao. Uh, some of you might have been involved. Uh, he's in Auckland University. We work quite closely. Uh, he did a trial on honey in lower leg ulcers and it didn't show any difference. All right. Yes, and honey can be very stingy. It's hyperosmolytic. All right. And um, therefore, it can sting a lot. It's a, so it can sting and can be painful. Um, I've been reported that the application of honey is a problem, it can be a problem, because what happens to honey on your toast, it gets runny, all right? So when it's warm, it gets runny. That's why they put it uh, in alginate, for example. So they soaked the alginate with honey, all right? Um, I used it, to, although I used it, especially if patients want to try it, and you tried everything else, usually it doesn't make a difference. <laughs> it's, like, it's just uh, quite expensive. We haven't got it in our wound pot guide because of the uh, Holt trial, which didn't show any difference in healing rates. So what was the, how was, does it answer the question? Yeah. I think that will do just nicely. So we've got, do you use halo cream? Yeah, it's a good question. Again, the halo system, it comes as a system. So there are four, three or four different products. I like the idea of it. We trialed it, Christchurch did a big trial on it, um, which I haven't got the results yet. We used it on, on a couple of patients, a system here, which is an antiseptic uh, dressing, a skin protector, um, a collagen product. So I think it's three. So I like the idea because it's a system oriented one. Um, I think it calls uh, hyaluronic acid, uh, uh, has promise. Um, does it, is it a game changer? Don't know, really skeptical. Uh, I'm always skeptical, I'm an old man. Um, uh, I, I believe much more what I told you all about, you know, not five mils, a bucket, clean it proper, do the stuff, do this and that. In terms of the dressing, I think Halo products are good products, and I think we will use them more, but we haven't got it on our product cards yet. The, I'll just tell you right now in the whole uh, around New Zealand, we, we hardly ever use products in our clinics if the district nurse does not have access to it, all right? Or we do a proper assessment, which is a long drawn out period. Uh, so uh, getting onto our product guideline is not that easy. So reps don't like it, uh, but um, they'll so be it, all right? There's a book coming out for the wound, a journal of wound care every year. It has 1,600 different dressings in it. That employs a lot of reps. And obviously, it's important. And I'm not saying they're bad products, but you, you get confused. We've got 3,000 nurses down here. Uh, you don't want to confuse 3,000 nurses. You know, keep it, simple as, keep it as simple as possible. All right. What are your thoughts on hyperbaric oxygen therapy for treating chronic wounds? Oh, very good. has its place. The evidence out there is... is, is it's okay, um, what, I, what I've read. Um, it is accessible, we use it, probably not often enough. We have used it for two patients in the past two years. One patient 
where we tried everything else, um, went to hyperbaric, had 80 applications, uh, and then the wound improved and the wound bleed um, healed, also using the HALO products, by the way, on that patients, because when you don't know, it doesn't work, nothing works, so we try that stuff. So now we don't know was it the hyperbaric uh, treatment uh, or, you know, the HALO. But anyway, we had a good outcome. And uh, yeah, it's, um, it's great, but the problem is with access, obviously. We've done Dunedin, Christchurch, people have to go up there, they live for six weeks up in Christchurch then. Um, it's funded, it's just good. So yeah, it had its place. Especially, obviously, their um, uh, blood flow is a problem. Yeah. Thank you. Um, can we use Protozan to activate AG mesh, AD, the Acticoke Flex 3 day instead of water? That's a good question. I can't answer that. Um, well, I don't know. I really don't know the answer. It's a good one. I asked the question. Prontosin, so the problem with saline and acticode is the salt crystals. Prontosin, as far as I know, because it's iodized, and the saline, uh, sodium iodine uh, is would negate the acticode ions, um, silver ions. So as far as I know, prontosin hasn't got any salt in it. So it should be, but you know, to that question, I would say ask the rep. I will ask the rep and then I, <laughs> next time. Something new for you too tonight. Yeah. How exciting. <laughs> I learn, every day I learn stuff. Good. And um, we've got a couple of questions around chronic eczema. So we've got one, um, how would you treat chronic eczema? And your thoughts on care of um, venous eczema and venous ulcers, please. Okay, how do you treat uh, chronic e eczema? There was one question, wasn't it? Chronic eczema? Yeah, okay, well, very tricky. I mean, this is something, look, now you're talking real stuff, you know, because that is something, um, um, you know, where we all struggle with. People have leg ulcer, you know, these chronic eczema patients, either they have an underlying uh, disease like rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory disease, and that's really something which is absolutely complex and I get help where I can and we should. And the other thing is a venous disease, eczema, which is a long-term disease, because you develop that over a long period of time. It's a, a disease over 20, 30 years before you actually do something about it usually. So by that time, the disease process has been there for a long time. So the short, the long answer, and the short answer is basically, we do a lot of, um, um, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, fatty cream, a lot of uh, ointments, a lot of uh, um, that stuff. We, in the, in, the, in the last few months, and I learned that from Rebecca, the nurse practitioner vascular, but also from dermatology, we use more and more hydrochloride, sodium hydrochloride. So this makes it janola, uh, diluted, because dermatologists use it, okay, for the kids with dermatitis. That could be useful. Again, this, uh, I had a slide in the presentation, I took it out because there was too many slides. So it's like a different talk, but it's uh, the solution of the pollution is the dilution. You know, use one cap of Janola to turn a bucket of water, all right? And then bath it and you know, and it reduces potassium permanganate can be really good for that. Again, a different talk, okay? So use ointments and then if it doesn't, if it's really painful, you don't get on top of it, use short, up to two weeks, uh, hydrocortisone cream. Okay, and again, uh, we learned that and we work together with dermatologists, that's what they do. So uh, we use all the whole gadget of uh, hydrocortisone ointments, if it's really bad, because that drives people nuts, all right? And it also is a problem when you, uh, you can't apply the most important treatment for those uh, 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 people with, le with venous leg ulcers, what is the most important treatment? What is it? Compression, all right? The problem is then people divide, develop this eczema and the compression is stopped. 
because they don't like it, it gets too itchy, it gets too terrible, it gets too painful, and the most important treatment is stop, and it gets worse again, like it's a vicious circle. Get on top of it quickly as you can. And um, what do you recommend for hypergranulation? Well, I think you're asking all the questions really, I think, uh, which are great, so I'll tell you, hypergranulation, um, Think about what is the problem. The problem is uh, hypergranulation. We think it's either due to moisture, we don't know, but we think, or it's due to bacteria. So it's this wild growing flesh growing up proud um, against the, the surrounding skin. So there are several treatments. We use silver nitrate for very so antimicrobial. So it's a silver. We use silver nitrate if it's appropriate for very small areas. We use Acticold for larger areas, a silver dressing, okay? Pressure is really useful. So pressure on top of it. And then also we use uh, hydrocortisone ointments, okay? Because it cuts down inflammation, okay? And inflammation is a big problem in chronic wound healing. I think that's all pressure, hydrocortisone and silver nitrate. And of course, if you're only keen and um, keen and able, uh, you can cut it away with a knife. So I've done that, but be aware, it can bleed quite a bit. It's usually not that painful, all right, because it's an unhealthy fiber tissue. There's not much nerves in there. Um, in relation to the buckets that you're using for in your clinics, um, do you use stainless steel buckets or how do you do the mouse infection control for those buckets between patients? Yeah, we use uh, um, we use um, um, no, we use buckets from uh, uh, plastic buckets, but we use uh, we use um, plastic uh, bags. We line them as plastic bags. Yeah, and they get cleaned and wiped to for each patient. Yeah. I'm just trying to find you one last goodie because yeah, you've you've got through twenty questions. But they still they still keep coming, so we might need to call it time. Um, but I'm just trying to find you a good final question. Oh my god! Oh my god. One. and I'm trying to find one as juicy as I possibly can. Oh, that's a juicy <laughs> it's, it's proving hard work, so just bear with me. Um, oh yeah, here we go. This is a nice one because this is a half <laughs> coat because this is looking at the pink wounds now. So what is the best dressing to protect granulating wounds? We have chronic wounds that are almost 100% granulating, then it breaks down again. Yeah, yeah, that's a, really, that's a really good one. Yeah, yeah. I know, I, I heard that uh, a colleague of mine, a plastic surgeon, Patrick, he explained it so nicely, and I thought, well, I have to remember that. So that, now I do explain it to patients. And I think also to, to colleagues, because you know when the wounds just think about it, and it's good because it's bloody cold outside. So I think about a lake, and it gets cold at night. And the lake freezes slowly over. This is the skin sitting on top of this lake, on top of the wound. And you know how fragile that little ice, thin ice, is on top of the lake. This is what that skin cells are when they're healing over this wound ages or over the wound, or you get this epithelial skin islands. So it's extremely fragile. It's like thousands of a times more thinner than a hair. All right. So it's very, very fragile. So every rubber, every rub, for example, every tension, okay, it will rub off very quickly. So all I can say to this is really I use a low adhesive or non-adhesive dressing um, which, or safe tech technology dressings, which actually uh, have silicon interface, so it moves with the wound or with the new skin, all right? And yeah, just don't take it off, leave it, leave it on. So we tell, you know, it's, it's I think I've done it for how long now, 16 years? I will do it for the next 16 years and tell people, leave the dressing on. No wound has ever healed by looking at it. All right, just leave it on, all right? Now, 
okay, and it's fine. So if there's no indication, just leave it on. Another maybe to finish that off is fix the dressing. Uh, if it's a lower leg wound, compression. Always better than no compression, all right? Yeah, very free. So it's very frustrating. I spoke to a student with me today, <laughs> second year nursing student. I'm nursing anyway, but in wound care, you have to be the eternal optimist, you know? Because and nursing is like this. If, you know, you go two step forward, one step back, sometimes two step back and one step forward. Those um, this is our life. But yeah, yeah, very free job. Wonderful. Now there's just someone saying about it, they're hoping that you would maybe share that tool that you've got for their DHB, but probably best if people email you to sort of yeah. offer that degree, eh? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and lots of people full of thanks. I've learned heaps from your presentation. You had over 200 people come online to hear you tonight. Oh my um, God. So yeah, yeah, you've really reached out across the whole of New Zealand, and That's there's a amazing. lot of appreciation. You've got, um, there's an OT, you've had overseas, you've had large hospitals, rural hospitals, district nurses all on board.